Well, hey everyone, and welcome back to my channel. It's fantastic to have you here. Um, today, I wanted to discuss vitamin D and what it does in the body. I want to talk about the benefits, uh, what you should take with it, uh, and how genetics affects it, and much, much more. But before we get started, please consider subscribing to the channel if you love this type of content, and check out our podcast. It's called Pushing the Limits. You can find it on good, all good pop, uh, podcast platforms, and give us a big thumbs up. if you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment below. Uh, so here we go into a deep dive into vitamin D or vitamin D3, also known as cholecalciferol, which plays a crucial role in various physiological processes in the body. So I wanted to give you some of the top benefits of this, of supplementing alongside getting your good sun exposure. Um, alongside that, I wanted to, to explain the importance of something called vitamin K2, MK7 alongside. So number one, enhanced bone health. So vitamin D3 is essential for calcium absorption and utilization, promoting strong and healthy bones. So it helps maintain proper levels of calcium and phosphorus in the blood, and it reduces the risk of osteoporosis and fractures. One of the biggest killers of our elderly is osteoporosis and when they have fractures. So something to be really, really aware of. Um, it's also amazing for immune system support. So vitamin D3 plays a critical role in the immune function, helping to modulate immune responses and defend against infections. It can enhance the activity of immune cells and support a healthy immune cell. So modulating the immune system. It improves mood and the mental health. Uh, so vitamin D3 receptors are found in different areas in the brain associated with mood regulation. So adequate levels of vitamin D3 uh, have been linked to improve mood, reduce symptoms of depression, and a lower risk of mental mental health disorders. Now, the next one up is cardiovascular health. So vitamin D3 has been associated with a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease. It helps maintain healthy blood pressure, supports proper uh, heart function, and may help to reduce the risk of heart attacks and strokes. It also reduces the risk of certain cancers. Now, I've had this one in my own mum's protocol. She has a CNS lymphoma. Um, and so I wanted to do a little bit of a deeper dive into this aspect of vitamin D because I don't think it's very, that well known that uh, vitamin D can be very helpful. And of course, none of this is medical advice and seek your own uh, medical advice from your provider, but just to give you for educational purposes. So adequate vitamin D3 levels have been linked to a lower risk of several types of cancers, including colon, breast, and prostate cancers. Vitamin D3 supports cellular growth regulation and has anti-cancer properties. It's been studied extensively for its uh, role in cancer prevention and in its treatment. And here's how it works in some of the research findings supporting its anti-cancer effects. So it regulates cell growth and proliferation, so vitamin D plays a role in regulating cell growth and preventing abnormal cell pr proliferation, which is crucial in cancer uh, in, in the cancer cells, and promotes differentiation of cells into their mature, specialized forms. It's also an anti-inflammatory. So chronic inflammation is a contributing factor to cancer development, along with many, many other things. Um, so vitamin D has an anti-inflammatory property and helps to modulate that immune response, reducing inflammation and potentially inhibiting tumor growth. It also helps with apoptosis induction. So apoptosis is a programmed cell death, and it's a natural process that eliminates damaged or abnormal cells. So vitamin D can induce apoptosis in cancer cells, promoting their death and preventing further proliferation. It also helps with the inhibition of angiogenesis. Now, angiogenesis is sometimes good and sometimes bad, but in relation to cancer, not such a good thing. So it's uh, is a pro angiogenesis is a process of forming new blood vessels, which is essential for tumor growth and for metastasis. So vitamin D can help inhibit angiogenesis, restricting the blood supply to tumors and potentially slowing down their progression. 
Uh, in, in the immune system modulation side of things, vitamin D plays a crucial role in modulating that immune system, and it can enhance the activity of immune cells, such as natural killer cells, uh, NK cells, and T cells, which are involved in recognizing and destroying cancer cells. So research findings supporting the anti-cancer effects of vitamin D, here just a couple of them. Um, there was a study published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology that found that colorectal cancer patients with higher levels of vitamin D had a significantly better survival outcomes compared to those with lower levels. Um, there was research published also in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute that showed that higher levels of vitamin D were associated with a reduced risk of breast cancer. And then a meta-analysis that was published in the British Medical Journal found that higher vitamin D levels were associated with a decreased risk of developing lung cancer. And then there was a study that was uh, done in, in the PLOS-1 demonstrated that vitamin D supplementation in women with a history of breast cancer led to a reduced risk of cancer reoccurrence and improved survival rates. Now, enough about cancer. That's, you know, all, all of that. And please, you know, go and talk to your doctor about that if that's something that you're dealing with and you want to add into your protocol. But now back to the more general aspects of uh, vitamin D. So the next benefit that I wanted to mention is enhanced cognitive function. So vitamin D3 is involved in, co in cognitive processes and in brain health. It can help improve cognitive function, can help improve your memory and reduce the risk of cognitive decline, including conditions like dementia and Alzheimer's. So I recently did uh, two interviews actually on my podcast with uh, experts in Alzheimer's. One was Dr. Dale Bredesen, a world-renowned uh, Alzheimer's researcher, and he mentioned uh, vitamin D in that interview as well. And I will also put the links to the show notes. And then I've also done one with Dr. Dave Jenkins, who's also versed in the uh, Bredesen Protocol and uh, is an expert in cognitive decline. And he also uh, mentions in that podcast all about how vitamin D works in the brain and what it does. So let's just do a, a bit of a deeper dive here as well. So vitamin D receptors or VDRs are found in various regions of the brain, indicating that vitamin D plays a role in brain function and in its in brain health. Um, and the following are some of the receptors in the brain that use vitamin D. So the hip campus, which is one of the areas that's hit first when you have something like Alzheimer's. Um, the hippocampus is a brain region involved in learning, memory, and cognitive function. It contains these VDRs, these vitamin D receptors, suggesting that vitamin D may play a role in these processes. Then there's the cerebral uh, cortex. Now, the cerebral cortex is responsible for higher cognitive functions, such as attention, perception, and language. So VDRs suggesting that vitamin D may play a role in motor function. And then there's the hypothalamus. Now, the hypothalamus is a vital region for regulating various bodily functions, including hormone production, hormone production, very important, body temperature, and also appetite. So VDRs are present in the hypothalamus, indicating that vitamin D may also have an impact on these regulatory processes. Then there's the dopaminergic system. Now, dopamine is a neurotransporter that's involved in reward, motivation, and movement. And VDRs are expressed in dopaminergic neurons, suggesting a potential link between vitamin D and their, the dopaminergic system. So by binding to these receptors, vitamin D can modulate gene expression and influence various processes in the brain. And it's believed to have neuroprotective effects, promote neuroplasticity. And I'm dealing with a mum who's had a massive aneurysm and a stroke um, seven years ago. So I know a lot about neuroplasticity and how important that is. And it also supports overall brain health. Uh, it also helps with improved insulin sensitivity. Uh, so vitamin D3 plays a role in insulin regulation, also in 
implicated in that whole dementia, Alzheimer's uh, situation. And of course, insulin uh, resistance is rife as an epidemic of insulin resistance in our society and glucose problems. Um, so vitamin D3 plays a, a, a crucial role in that insulin regulation and glucose metabolism. So adequate levels of vitamin D3 are associated with improved insulin sensitivity and a reduced risk of developing type 2 diabetes, which I call the gateway to hell. Once you've got type, type 2 diabetes, it is the gateway to um, you know some of the age-related diseases like cancers, like Alzheimer's. Uh, like cardiovascular disease. So you always want to be stopping it, but way, way before something like that happens. So insulin resistance, um, getting on top of that early is one of the things I talk about a lot in the podcast. Um, Anti-inflammatory effects. So again, I've mentioned this before, but in relation to this, vitamin D3 exhibits anti-inflammatory properties, helping to regulate the body's inflammatory response. And chronic inflammation is really, you know, at the base of all disease, basically. So we definitely want to reduce the amount of inflammation that we have. It helps with enhanced calcium metabolism. So vitamin D3 supports calcium metabolism, ensuring calcium is efficiently utilized in the body. And so when taking D, uh, vitamin D3, it's also important that you supplement with something called vitamin K2 MK7. So vitamin K2 directs calcium to the bones and the teeth where we want it, while preventing it from accumulating in the arteries and in the soft tissues where we don't want it. Okay, so overall, um, um, going back to the vitamin D, overall health and well-being aspect of it, um, adequate levels of vitamin D contribute to overall health and well-being, and it supports optimal body, bodily functions, promotes healthy cell growth and differentiation, and is essential for numerous physiological processes. So when taking the vitamin D3, it's yeah, I highly recommend that you take it with K2, MK7. Now there's also uh, MK4, so K2, K2 that's called MK4. So let me do a little bit of a deeper dive into the differences between MK4 and MK7. So MK4 is also known as menaquinone 4 and MK7 is menaquinone 7. And these are different forms of vitamin K2. And this is an essential nutrient for bone and cardiovascular health. Now, the main difference between MK4 and MK7 lies in their chemical structure and the bioavailability. So the chemical structure of MK4 contains a four carbon side chain, while MK7 has a longer side chain with seven carbons. Now, the structural difference affects their properties and how they are metabolized in the body. So MK4 is found is mainly found in, in animal-based foods such as meat and dairy and eggs. And on the other hand, MK7 is primarily primarily derived from uh, fermented foods such as natto, uh, which is a traditional Japanese food made from soybeans and other fermented foods. And MK4 has a shorter half life in the body compared to the MK7. And this means that MK4 is rapidly metabolized and cleared from the bloodstream, requiring more frequent dosing to maintain adequate levels. MK7, on the other hand, with its longer half-life, has better bioavailability and can remain in the bloodstream for a longer, more extended period of time, allowing for less frequent dosing. So when it comes to tissue distribu distribution, MK4 is preferentially taken up by tissues outside of the liver, such as the brain, the pancreas, and arterial walls. And in contrast, MK7 has a more prolonged circulation in the bloodstream and can be taken up by various tissues, including the liver. So when it comes to the function of both MK4 and MK7, they both play crucial roles in activating proteins involved in calcium metabolism and in the bone health. However, MK7 has been shown to have a stronger effect on activating osteocalcin, a protein involved in uh, bone mineralization. Now, MK7 has also been studied for its potential cardiovascular benefits, such as reducing arterial calcification. Um, this one is, is dear to my heart. I lost my dad uh, to an aortic aneurysm. Uh, you want to be, you know, being on top of the, the state of your arteries and the flexibility of your arteries. So you don't want uh, calcification building up on those arteries. 
So when it comes to supplementation, MK7 is often preferred due to its longer half-life and its better bioavailability. And it allows for a convenient sort of once a day compared to multiple dosing that would be required to get the same effect with MK4. So there you have it. So Vitamin K2, MK7 works synergistically with vitamin D3. Now, the D3 is the activated form. I should have explained that a little bit earlier to ensure the proper calcium utilization, preventing calcium imbalances and promoting overall health. So vitamin K2 helps direct calcium to those those places that we want them away from the arteries uh, and reducing that risk of, of that. Uh, so, so there you have it, a bit of a short introduction to vitamin D and what it does in the body. <laughs> um, but I would highly recommend that you also go and get a vitamin D blood test before you start supplementing, if you can, um, so that you can establish what your baseline is so that you can see if you uh, are needing vitamin D and you want to be on the upper end of that normal range, really, not at the lower end of what, what's considered normal, especially in, in the winter months we're in New Zealand and we're in the middle of winter so we want to make sure that we have good vitamin D levels um, there are also genetic differences between people as to how they activate how they transport and how they utilize vitamin D now I do genetic testing in my company and this is just one of the areas of genes that we look at um, for example there's, there's hundreds that we we do in our testing um, but this is one of the one of the key ones that I really like to look at first now these genes are involved in various aspects of uh, vitamin D metabolism and its function, including its activation, its binding to the receptors, and the degradation. So various mutations in these genes can impact vitamin D levels. Uh, and its responsiveness to supplementation. So sometimes you could be taking supplements, but you're not actually responding that well. Um, and it can help you look at individual susceptibility to vitamin D related health conditions. So genetic testing can provide a more personalized insight into the role of these genes in vitamin D metabolism. If you're wanting to find out about that, let me know and inform appropriate supplementation and management strategies. So there is the VDR gene, which is responsible uh, for the binding and interacting with activated vitamin D. Then there's the CYP27B1 or 27B1 gene, which codes for the enzyme, which converts the inactive vitamin D into its active form. And then there's the CYP24A1 gene, which encodes for the, um, the enzyme 24 hydroxylase, which is responsible for the degradation and inactivation of active vitamin D. And as someone of Maori descent, I'm from New Zealand and from Polynesian descent, um, I have poor vitamin D genetics, and that makes um, quite a lot of sense. Uh, so my skin is more brown in tone, and my ancestors were out all day in the sun. So they got enough exposure. Now that we are fully covered up for a big part of the year, uh, and we are also indoors much more, and knowing my own genetics, I have to make sure I get vitamin D as a supplement, as well as trying to get ex skin exposure each day. Now, not, not so long that I get burned, obviously, um, but enough that I get that vitamin D activation. Um, I like to go out without a hat on, get my uh, forehead and my arm, Arms, my my legs, if I can, if it's not too cold, um, at some 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 level of exposure every day to make sure that I'm activating it. Um, I'll also put a link down below to our genetic testing information if you want to find out more about this um, and this the types of information that can be gleaned from that testing. There's a heck of a lot, not just vitamin D, obviously. Um, so that's it for today. Thanks so much for listening and please make sure you subscribe to our channel. And if you enjoy everything we do, uh, we do lots of things with longevity, biohacking, anti-aging, high performance, health optimization and more. Uh, and please don't forget to check out our podcast, Pushing the Limits. We've been going for over eight years. Um, I think we're over 300 episodes now. Um, so please hit the like button here on the YouTube channel, subscribe to it, hit the notification bell and share with your family and friends. And we really appreciate you doing that. It helps us keep this uh, all on air and we so appreciate you. Thank you very much.